MC today, uh, trying to keep the general process uh, correctly timed and also making uh, various important announcements uh, so you know what you're doing here. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you uh, on this sunny day to Plymouth, to Plymouth Plantation. I hope that the view of the water inspires you to think about our waters here in southeastern Massachusetts. And the goals of today's conference are to share our resources, hopefully inspire you to collaborate with each other, and help all of us accomplish our goals to protect and preserve our water resources in southeastern Massachusetts. I would like to particularly thank all of our sponsors, especially Aquarium Water, the Sheehan Family Foundation, the Island Foundation, and the Division of Ecological Restoration, and of course, Plymouth Plantation for giving us this wonderful uh, spot to hold our conference. <laughs> and far, as far as logistics are concerned, the men's room is in that direction through that door, and the ladies' room is back where um, you came in, around that corner. We have uh, souvenir mugs for everybody that are over on that table. Um, that you can take home, and we have markers over there if you would like to take it now, or not now, but at the break, um, and write your name on it, um, or you can just pick it up at the end. Um, if you're more prone to kicking something over on the floor, you may want to wait till the end. Uh, the names are to prevent any spread of turns. Um, we are going to have a, oh, and they're all washed, so uh, we'd like to, to thank our intern who did that job. Um, <laughs> there is going to be a raffle at the end of our uh, conference today, and you do have to be present to win. We have um, various prizes over here. We have a North and South River oh, We got Spinner that was donated by Terry Pond's watershed. We got um, Kayak Rental. We have a North and South Rivers. Watershed Association goodie bag. Uh, we have uh, some water conservation kits, which have uh, shower timers and an aerator and a flow measuring bag. Um, so those are all wonderful prizes that you could win today. Uh, our first session, so the, the morning session, is going to focus on issues that are relevant, uh, in particular to nonprofits, fundraising, science and data collection, and <coughs> outreach and uh, there will be a 15 minute break between each of the parts of uh, the morning sessions and so we encourage you not to go too far away because you don't want to be in your seats for the next session but do look at the posters um, you know get a, a snack or a drink uh, the way that the panels are going to work is that we're going to um, have everybody uh, some of them are a little different than others, but generally there's going to be a discussion, um, small presentation from each of the uh, members of the session, uh, and then we'll have uh, some time for questions from the audience. Um, someone will bring you a microphone to uh, ask your question. Uh, so I think that covers all of our announcements for the morning, and uh, we'll get started with our first session, which focuses on fundraising. And Samantha Woods from North South Rivers is our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? My name is Samantha Woods. I'm the executive director for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, and we are members of the Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Mass and part of the hosts for the uh, day. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to see many familiar faces and many new faces. So um, I hope that you'll find the sessions informative. And most importantly, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask questions and network with people uh, throughout the day. So we have built in time for that. Um, our conference coordinator asked me to ask you if you guys could, uh, could move in so that people as they come uh, don't have to walk across you if you so if there's a seat next to you that you could move into the middle of the row so that uh, we're not fuddling around too much during our sessions 
So, um, so this panel is about fundraising. Um, the goals of this session are to expose you to different fundraising opportunities to sustain um, your organizations uh, and to raise funds for projects related to water resource protection and restoration, hopefully in Southeastern Mass, but we're not against it if you're not from Southeastern Mass. Um, we have three panelists with great expertise and uh, we focused on three different areas, seeking major donor support, private foundation support, and working with a fundraising consultant who um, will be speaking with us. The format, um, each panelist will have two to three minutes each to introduce themselves, and then I will pose two questions to each of the panelists, and uh, they will have each three minutes to respond. Um, depending on the time available, we may be able to ask more. Um, we will leave 10 minutes at the end of the session uh, for you all to ask questions of the, of the panelists because again, our hope is that uh, you are interested in what they would like to, to offer you. They have great expertise and this is for your benefit. Um, so we wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to talk with them, ask them uh, questions about fundraising. And then in between each session, as Sarah mentioned, we'll have 15 minutes for you to get up, stretch your legs and please Avail yourselves again of the panelists. They'll be, you know, waiting here to talk to you after the session, uh, in between uh, the next session. So I think that's clear. Great. Um, so uh, each of our panelists are going to introduce themselves, so I won't do that. Uh, so start with Bill Stanton. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Stanton. I'm going to try without the microphone. If there's a problem, please raise your hand and I'll pick it up. Anyway, my name is Bill Stanton. Um, I, I was a practicing attorney. I had a firm out of Marshall, Massachusetts for 15 years. During the course of that law practice, I went into Mass Audubon for some pro bono work. And in the mid-90s, I was asked to help out in the middle of their centennial campaign for some land acquisition projects, which led to me winding up in their development office. And I ran some regional capital campaigns and then wound up doing an entire capital so I have experience from capital campaigns to major donor fundraising and uh, general administration of the development office. After putting 60,000 miles on a year on my car. Microphone. Would you use the microphone? Please? Absolutely. Um, after putting 60,000 uh, miles a year on my car, I decided I'd bike to work. And so I was the executive director for the North and South River Watershed for a couple of years. And then I moved on to the Trustees of Reservations, where I was a major gift officer for the North Bureau of Special Projects. And then most recently, I was in the city of Boston, raising money for the Boston Natural Areas Network. So I have this wide range of uh, nonprofit experience. I was running a big shop, running a smaller shop, doing major donor giving. And I hope later on to share some of that uh, Well, thanks so much, Samantha. Thanks for having me here today. I'm Sarah Kelly, Senior Program Officer at the Island Foundation in Marion, Massachusetts. Um, I'll give a word on the Island Foundation. It's a private foundation, a family foundation. It was started in 1979, so we just had our 35th anniversary. It was started by uh, Van Allen and Mary Clark. We have three geographic focus areas. The primary one is southeastern Massachusetts, that's sort of the home region. We do fund in Rhode Island and Maine as well, and a very limited number of communications. And we have four major program areas. Um, they are one program area focused on the city of New Bedford, a lot of funding focused on youth development, arts and culture, basic needs, and historic and cultural work in the city. A smaller area focused on education with a special emphasis on underserved youth. A new uh, small global area, but one that's been quite exciting to see how the values connect across the program areas. And then the environment program area, which I primarily focus on um, and have been there for almost six years now. Within that environment area, roughly, there are kind of four areas, and it's a little artificial because they're all connected to each other, but 
Um, we have some work focused on marine mammal conservation, which is a very long-standing board priority, especially right whales. Um, working landscapes, which is what we call, or how we made the sustainable agriculture and fisheries work that we do. Um, a program area or sub-area that connects climate change, alternative energy, and regional planning. So trying to find ways to make these really major challenges and topic areas accessible and meaningful on the local level. And last but not least, our coastal land, water, and habitat conservation, which is where, I uh, see what um, brings me here today to get the chance to be here and where Watershed Action Alliance's work has been so relevant for our priorities. And just a quick word on my own background. Most of my background before I came to the foundation was in sustainable agriculture and food systems. I have a master's in plant and soil sciences, which feels kind of like ancient history now, so grill me please, <laughs> but um, that is my background. And um, before coming to the foundation, I ran uh, the sort of bi-local agriculture group for southeastern Massachusetts called CMAP. So I have been in the executive director of a tiny nonprofit seat, and I have it as a personal goal for myself to remember every day in my role now what that's like, how hard that is, how challenging, and how many things that um, people are juggling, and to find the resources that you need for your mission. So I'll leave it there, and I'll speak a little more about our priorities and some of the approaches um, maybe a little bit later. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bethany Kendall, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of ESC of New England, a not-for-profit management consulting organization providing services to about 100 other not-for-profits in management consulting and capacity building. And I know I'll be saying a lot more about my organization and the services we provide a little bit later on. But what I would like to share with you today is I feel a little bit like the hair club for men. I'm not just a person who runs an organization that provides consulting to other organizations, I am also responsible for all of the fundraising for my charitable, not for profit. So I do it and live the pain every single day, which is why I'm so happy to hear you say that you don't forget on the other side of the table what it's like to run a small nonprofit, which has been my career. I've run four, this is the fourth not for profit that I've been the chief executive of, all smaller organizations all with a dual role of the chief executive and also the chief development officer. And I think whether you hold the title or not, every chief executive is responsible for fundraising, as is the board, and we'll talk more about that as we go into it. But it's a role that we share, and it has to be shared in order to be successful, in my view. Two of the organizations I've run have been membership-based, and some of you may, may be running charitable or nonprofit membership-based organizations, and two have been on the 501c3 side, strictly the others were 501c6s with charitable entities attached to them. So I have had to service people who were paying dues to be a part of an effort, as well as people who were making contributions to be a part of the effort. And I think what's so important is understanding the motivation behind those who you would like to invest in supporting what they're seeking, because if you don't understand their motivation, it's often hard to be 
successful and we'll give back to them. Um, I, I think that we all want to believe, and I do, that fundraising is all about um, the efforts to desire to do a part of something there. The reason someone chooses to more organization or cause your particular mission is very personal and understanding that is, is so important. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, a lot more about this important topic this morning. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Bethany and Bill and Sarah. Um, so the first question is for Bill Stanton, and the focus is on major donor uh, giving. And the question I've posed for Bill is, is major donor fundraising something a small nonprofit can and should do, and why? Yes, they can do it. Yes, they can do it. Yes, they should do it. And why? Well, Willie Sutton, the bank robber, was once asked, why do I rob banks? Because that's where the money is. <laughs> Same answers with the bank robbers. Um, when I was doing the campaign of the trustees of reservations, uh, we raised $65 million over five years. But the interesting fact about that campaign, and this is a fact, not an opinion, is that $50 million of that campaign came from 300 individuals. There were 15,000 gifts, but 300 individuals gave the vast majority of money. And that is true of most campaigns. So the same is true when you're trying to develop a diverse revenue flow for your organization. It is human nature to not write a nice anonymous grant. When you're sitting and you have lots of things to do, having that extra coffee, developing relationships with people you don't know, is not necessarily comfortable for someone. However, it is part of running an organization and getting to know um, individuals who can give you support. Another fact, and this has been true since they started measuring this since uh, World War II, is that corporate giving, when we look at the pot, corporate giving year after year after year is between 5 and 7 percent of that pot. Foundation giving, which is very generous and very needed, is usually between 10 and 15 percent of that pot. That leaves 75 to 85 percent the pie is from individuals. So that's why, although when you're looking at where the money is, where the money can come from, it really is from individuals. And I think it's, it's so, you can do this. It's something that it's not, you might not feel comfortable about doing it, but you can build those relationships. Just as Bethany said, it's personal. It's asking people for help, it's not asking them for money. You have to identify these people, find out where they are, develop those relationships, and over time, you can find your major dollars. So the next question I have for you, Bill, is um, given that major donor giving and individual giving is such a big part of what we should be doing, what advice could you give to a small nonprofit who has limited resources and staff um, on how to engage with major donors? How do we get to find, identify them, build those relationships, um, and make it a priority? Well, the first task is to identify in your community who are these people. They're usually not, not that anonymous. They're giving to the hospital in your area. They are members of your community. They tend to reveal themselves at the top of the thank you list of the other nonprofits in your area. So you need to identify them. Then it's a matter of how do you build those relationships. And the most important thing that I can tell you is, is, again, as Bethany said, it's developing a personal relationship, which does not begin with an ask for money. It's meeting that person. It's finding out what this person is interested in. And I've always found the most important first ask is just ask for help. All of us, when we're running our small nonprofits, have a variety of challenges we're facing. And they're not all money with them. And many times, it's just you're sitting there and saying, no, I don't know how to manage this particular budget problem. I have a political issue that I need to talk to the state representative about. What, how would you approach this? And it's building that interest, that, that opportunity for interest from a major donor that is most important. Look for those connections. You might not necessarily have the direct connection to a major donor in your area. 
but you may have a board member, you may have a staff member, you may have a volunteer. I know Mr. and Mrs. X. Um, I happen to, my, my son cuts their lawn or something along those things. You know, just all these different connections which are constantly going back to that list of identification and finding out where can I make those connections. So it, it's really, you can call it moves in the major donor world that you have to identify, you have to meet, cultivate, then you get into the ask a portion of the uh, relationship and finally there's keeping them in the fold. Terrific. So we're going to move on to Sarah. Uh, we are, we started early, so that's good. We're already like ahead. So we'll figure out how that's going to work out. But um, it's good because it gives us more time. Um, so Sarah, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your expertise and, and background in foundation giving. Um, so maybe you could help, um, help us out with, in southeastern Massachusetts, could you tell us what foundations you think are most likely to support environmental initiatives, particularly water-related work? And how can nonprofits identify foundations that might be good potential funders for their work? So two-part question. Do you know of any you could tell us and maybe share with the group besides the Island Foundation, although you could certainly speak more to them? And then uh, how, how, what, how, what other things can we do? What other kinds of research can we do to identify those friendly foundations? Sure. Um, all right, let's see what I can tell you about that. Well, um, when we were talking about the panel, there were four foundations that kind of, or four funders that came immediately to mind in response to this, and a couple of them are here today, and they all have said that they do fund this kind of work. I want to be sure to confirm and are willing to be listed. Um, so we have Sheehan Family Foundation, which I know you guys are familiar with, and Laura is here and has I'm sure it's well known to many of you for their long involvement in this area. Plus, I love their turtle on their logo. Um, the Bilzekian Family Foundation, Jeff Bilzekian was not able to be here today, but said that he is uh, definitely that they're involved in this kind of work. And the same goes for the Eagle Mirror Foundation. Um, and Dan Sorrells, who's their executive director, did say that they have a pretty full slate already for 2015, but that this area is an area that's of interest to them. And also here today is the Massachusetts Environmental Trust. I know that Bill is here somewhere. Oh, in the back there. And they have a table as well. And um, Bill asked me to emphasize that this is um, not a private foundation, but is actually funded by the license plate sales from the environmental license plate. So this is a way that you and all your members can actually participate in generating more funds for conservation work. So um, those are four that, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to work with all of them, and I think there's a, um, a good start in this area. The, the, those are locally or relatively locally based. I, however, I'm thinking about sort of the second part of that question. I would really encourage you not to limit yourself to just looking at locally based foundations. There are only four that we came up with. I know there are more, but those are the four that came to mind. And um, you know, as Bill mentioned, it's a small landscape of foundations and a small percentage of, of giving overall. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, but potentially productive avenues for groups in this region, and I've seen this in food systems in a lot of areas um, as I've worked here, is to find ways to frame your work and present your work either as a model, a model approach, or something um, unique about the way you're approaching your work, or to talk about elements of the ecosystem here that are so unique that they would merit the attention of foundations that have broader regional or national focus. Um, it is challenging, but you know that it's a small geography with a small funding <coughs> funder pool. So finding those ways to get out to the larger national groups, I think, is really critical. Um, one quick example it would be something like the Patagonia Foundation, which funds small watershed restoration projects all around the country with a grassroots emphasis. Um, so that would be a question of just making the case of why is this project like of such high importance, whatever it is that you're working on. Um, a second avenue, and I'm just you know touching on these really briefly, um, that I want to mention today because this is a trend that we're really tracking is the rise of donor advised funds. Um, this is a sort of trend in philanthropy that we, we've kind of been watching. More and more families are choosing, you know, if they have wealth or they have assets that they want to 
shelter for taxes and then use for charitable purposes. Instead of setting up a foundation, they're putting these into donor advised funds, which can reside either at a community foundation or at um, like a financial services firm like Fidelity or um, Hemingway and Barnes is one in Boston that houses a number of these funds. Um, the assets in foundations are still much greater than those in donor advised funds, but the growth rate of donor advised funds is, is they're growing at a greater rate. Um, so I think that that is something that's worth um, following. Trying to pick up on the second part of your question about how you would find more information for the national foundations or foundations um, that are in a broader region, for example, Boston-based, and I hope this isn't too basic, I don't know, I'm sure many of your staff are experienced, but the foundation directory online is kind of the granddaddy of doing research on foundations. You can search by geography, topic area, there's a lot of ways that you can try to narrow down your search. Um, this used to be called the Foundation Founder, Funder, Foundation Finder, but I went and looked for this and I was told that that particular tool would now allow me to look perfectly poreless and natural, so I think that name is not what um, it used to be. It's been taken over by a makeup company. So Foundation Directory Online. It's a little pricey. It's about $1,000 for an annual membership that lets you look at the actual grants that have been funded by the foundations, which is totally critical for getting a sense of what they really are working on. Some of them may or may not have websites, they may have a one-line mission, so to really see what they're emphasizing, you need to look at their grants list. Okay, I will keep that short. There are a couple low-cost options for that, so maybe I can speak to anyone in person, and I'll just say briefly on the donor advised funds, my sense is that groups are really networking to these through their board members in the ways that Bill mm -hmm. described. Terrific. All right. <laughs> okay, so another question for you, Sarah, actually. You're oh. still on. You just, but I'm going to give you. I'm going to tell you that you have less time now. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Even though we have more time in our session, I think okay. um, I want to keep it uh, limited. So, if you could maybe just take two minutes to give us some um, ideas or advice that you would give to a small profit seeking support, and, and you know, what are the mistakes or pitfalls to avoid? That, uh, and then elements that might constitute a good application. So say you've identified the guy, the foundation, the donor advice fund, so what what would be uh, something that would be a good application? Okay. Elements of? Um, well, I think maybe I'll take a quick step back and just say first that once you've identified some foundations that look like they might be a match, it really picks up on what Bill said that it, even though there can be a sort of cloak around foundations, that it does really come down to relationships, just in the same way that major donors do. Foundation boards are people, their families are individual, they have staff who are people who are kind of trying to read the tea leaves from a couple directions, they have values and strategies that they prefer, even like underneath the, the areas that they say are their priorities. Um, for a quick example, from the Island Foundation in the Land and Water Conservation, we used to fund direct acquisition or direct like remediation of specific watersheds, and there are so many projects of value in the region that we have shifted more to like a coalition or umbrella capacity building strategy. So that would be just one example of something that you might not find out without a conversation. So trying to get a conversation and a productive approach that I find, at least from my side, is just to say that you would like to talk to someone and see if there might be a fit. Uh, with your work, you know, just keeping it, like Bill said, it's an initial inquiry and you, it kind of signals that you understand that there does have to be a fit. To me, it's so evident that foundations do not get anything done without you. We don't get the work done. So that seems critical to me. Um, and at least you can signal that you are looking for that. Um, that. Um, mistakes or things to avoid, I think the only thing that I would say is just to not, that sending a full sort of cold proposal, it's not that it's bad, it's just not worth your time. It's not worth your time unless you know they're looking for it, unless you know they're gonna be receptive. Um, and if you, you know, like as with job hunting say, if you have someone on the other end that's ready for your resume or ready for your proposal, you're gonna have a much, much, much better chance. Um, I think I'll, let just see if there was one other. Oh, one other thing that I just want to mention briefly. I feel that there is an overemphasis on grant writing as if it were some mysterious 
the linguistic power that you can marshal that would make your case like so in amazing language and so flowery. <laughs> I would say it's much more productive to think about just clear project planning. What is your pro what is the need? What are you going to get done? How are you going to get that done? Our proposals are only three to five pages, so there's not room or need really for, like I said, a huge kind of um, discussion and just really being clear about what you're going to work on. And there's plenty of places that will charge you a lot to train you in grant writing, and I, my personal sense is that's not really worth the investment as much as just being clear about your mission. Terrific. I hope I'm sure. Thank you, Sarah. So next is Bethany Kendall with the Executive Service Corps. Um, and so I thought it would be useful and kind of, uh, actually I'm a little bit self-motivated in asking Bethany here, I've heard about Executive Service Corps and um, from some of my colleagues and I have an, enough knowledge about them. So um, a little bit self-motivated, I'm learning too, um, even though I've been fundraising for over a decade now. Um, so what kind of assistance can Executive Service Corps offer for nonprofits? And if you could please include if there are any upfront costs or any application process, so if there are people in the audience that would like to avail themselves of you know, how to do it. Sure, and I have no problem with shame, shameless self-promotion, but I'm going to keep that very brief because I want to share some fundraising experiences, two stories that I want to tell you that I think will be very helpful to you. ESC of New England, we abbreviate, it's quite a mouthful. It's 33 years old as an organization. We are a charitable not-for-profit. We have 150 highly skilled, talented consultants in our practice in all areas, and we do have a practice that specializes in working with environmental organizations, all of whom volunteer their time to work in teams to help not-for-profits. We charge an affordable, based on a sliding scale, flat fee for our consulting services, and that is partially how we enable uh, an infrastructure that allows us to have the very best consultants who are consistently going through professional development so they stay on the cutting edge of what's happening and we're able to assess your needs, maintain quality control, provide you with what you need and ensure that all the deliverables are made to you through our contracts, very much like any other consulting service. Uh, I do have cards, very easy, that explain our services. We offer a complimentary assessment visit that we will send a consultant or two to meet with you and your organization at no cost, no obligation to help you think through what some of your key issues are. There's no, literally no obligation. If we can help you further, we're happy to do that and talk about it. If that session has been helpful to have someone who's impartial with nothing personal to gain from it other than helping you with your organization, we're glad we were able to serve the community. That's part of our mission. So you'll find everything about our programs and how to be in touch with us on these cards, which are over there, and I'll stay for the break if you'd like to talk more. But I wanted to pick up on um, something that was said by Bill about major donors and uh, seeking them out and understanding motivation, but I also think that sometimes we overlook opportunities that are right in front of us that we just were not that conscious of. And I want to share two real life experiences. Um, before I came to ESC, I ran an organization called the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship international but Boston based. And when the announcement went out that I had been brought on to lead the organization, shortly thereafter I had a call from a gentleman in, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And he would just go on and on and on talking of Schweitzer philosophy, the books he read, quotes from the Bible. He would call me probably three or four times a month and he would just want to talk about it. And as I got to know him a little bit better, he would share that he was living in a tiny one-room place because he wanted to mimic Schweitzer's life. And you know, what's the natural thing? You're polite, you listen, it drags on, and you're saying to yourself, you know, I sure hope somebody's watching out for this guy because I don't know if he's really mentally competent, I'll be honest with you, because it just would go on and on and on. In December of that year, which was about seven or eight months later, I received a call from him saying, I wanted to make a little donation to you all. I, I think you're doing great work. And we received what for us, which was a major gift, $35,000. And the check cleared. <laughs> and I learned he had his own plane. And he flew it to Boston to meet with us and continued to invest. I can tell you, 
there was not one moment in any of those conversations that led me to believe there would be anything coming to us other than someone from their heart was very interested in the work we did. Sometimes you just don't know where it's going to come from. And sometimes there are already people right in your own midst that you haven't even thought about. But ask yourself, why are these people always coming to meetings? Why are they there anytime you have an event? Have you talked with them further about how they'd like to support your work? You might find that you don't have to have the resources of a large shop where you can do the kind of research that tells you somebody's <coughs> net worth, because sometimes it's just a matter of how they're choosing to use whatever that net worth is to support causes. Um, second story, uh, a large Boston-based organization that serves um, youth does an annual Christmas drive for toys for children um, who won't be getting them otherwise. And they had a huge storm full of those toys, and. They had someone who approached them one day and said, I'd like to volunteer for you this season. I know a lot about inventory and how to stock things, and I'd just like to be a volunteer. And they thought it was a little unusual, and they weren't quite sure about him, but he passed at least the court checks or whatever they needed to do. And he came, and he whipped that place into shape amazingly well. It wasn't until some months after that that they realized he understood about inventory because he came from a family business of a very well-known large retail establishment that had gone public. And therefore, as he became more involved at the, at the service level, he also became a major donor. Never did they imagine when he was working in that stock room day after day as a volunteer that he had the capacity to become a large donor. This happens probably far more than any of us would think. And that's why I wanted to share those two stories with you because if you just look around at who is already in your family, your work family, the people who come to your events, whether they write a check or not, anyone who continues to show great interest may have far greater capacity than you might have initially thought. So just be open to that because it happens all the time, every day, I'm sure. Bill, you saw that happen, um, and you may have as well, just stories that you've heard where people um, surprised you with what they were able to do. So sometimes we don't have to go so far to look, and I wanted to share that with you. ESC is happy to come out and help you if you have never put together a fundraising plan, if you want to talk about how we can help educate your board on what it means to be a fundraising board. All boards should be fundraising boards. Some need to work more at the direct level and others can be the ones who go out and do the ask. But they can also be folks who thank people who give money as well as ask people to give money. And finding an appropriate role for everyone to be engaged in the philanthropy in your organization is critically important. I feel that building a culture of philanthropy within the organization is where you start where it's everyone from the board, volunteers, staff, everyone needs to be involved in fundraising. And that doesn't mean asking. Okay, I want to get to the next question for you, Bethany. There's just one other one. Um, and so this one, maybe you kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you just give us uh, examples of um, two or three areas that lead people to success in fundraising? You know, I think you've kind of already done that. And if there's stuff in the box, maybe those just Quick examples. I, I would start that the board has to truly be behind fundraising, and that doesn't mean you have the staff to go fundraise. Um, in most smaller organizations, failure in fundraising starts at the board level mm -hmm. because the board doesn't understand its role and its responsibility. I'm a firm believer, as ESC is, that you have to have 100% giving on your board. If you don't have people on your board who are willing to write a check, then they shouldn't be on your board. How can you go out to the community and ask strangers to give you money if your own board is not contributing? Everyone may not be able to contribute at the same level, but everybody should be contributing something. So you can tell the foundation, we are all giving here, because I'm sure you look at that, do you not? Yes, and from my prior role also, I can say that's absolutely so critical, and I wish I had and the hardest part as as an executive, whether you're the volunteer executive or a paid executive, 
it's not your role to tell your board often best practices because they will not hear it from you, which is why bringing someone in from the outside to share best practices, you may know this, you may be able to deliver it as well as we can, but they won't hear the message from you, but they will hear it hopefully from an outsider. So that's critically important. Secondly, um, talking about the building of a culture of philanthropy and gratitude, there are people on your board who will say, I don't want to ask people for money. Okay, that's fine. Who will you introduce us to? We'll do the ask. Will you send thank you notes to people who have already given? Everybody has to have an active role in it, and you start with your board. Um, and working together in tandem with whoever is doing the actual fundraising execution, whether it's other volunteers or um, a staff person. So I think that's really important. Was there another question, or did I use up all my time? You've used your time. Okay. I just wanted right. to ask my uh, conference coordinator, since we're early, okay. do you want me to end at 45 minutes, or do you want me to end at the time we were going to end? You can, you can continue to. Until 9.30. Okay, so we do have time. So that is great, because I have some other questions for each of you. I want to come back to Bill. Um, so Bill, uh, we, we want to talk a little bit more about Major Donor, and um, maybe you can give us some insight on what can be done to sustain support. So you've got the person, you've cultivated that person, you've had, built a relationship. How do you keep them with you? Because guess what? Every year you still need money. So how do you keep them? Thank you. Thank you. Say thank you again. You can't thank your donors enough, and particularly your key major donors. You're not going to, unless you're in an unusual circumstance, you're not going to have that many. So as part of your work plan, if you are fortunate enough to have major donors, we were talking earlier, what is a major donor? Probably for a group like this, you're starting, if someone's giving you a check for $500 or more, that person is at least indicating that there is more than average capacity there. A lot of people don't, most people don't walk around writing $500 checks. Now they may not, that might be the limit of their capacity, but at least that they set themselves apart. So thank those people. Make sure they are thanked by phone, in person, by letters, by your board. You cannot thank somebody enough. Deepen the relationship. And again, this is the, you don't deepen a relationship by asking them for more money. You deepen the relationship by occasionally just saying, say, Sam, can I come over and have a cup of coffee? Maybe you know, one of their children is having a little trouble in school or whatever. Talk about them. Let them talk about themselves. Sit down and let them talk as opposed to you rattle off about all your problems at the nonprofit and now you don't have enough money and this project's not getting done and that. No, what you want to do is deepen the relationship. Now, you are not going to become best friends with all these people. That's not how life works. But you will become best friends with some. I was talking to Sam before the conference started this morning. I've made I've over thousands of asks. Most of the answers have been no. Some of these people have become friends. Some of these people have become very good friends. It happens naturally. And so you just have to let the... It's an organic situation that you let the relationship develop. Just as Bethany was saying, you don't know where it's going to come from. <clears throat> One of our pleasant surprises when I was on the Marshfield Conservation Commission, a local school teacher, fortunately she died, but in her will she gave us $850,000. Where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> we didn't even ask for that, but it happens. And it happens by doing good work, being out in the community, and keeping the donor informed, keeping your major donor informed. But you don't have to have coffee with them every week, but you do have to make sure whenever your good work is being done that a personal letter goes out to them saying, Sam, did you hear about this great project? You know, the dam went down, the water's been cleaned, we're doing more work out there. It's not that difficult to make that part of your work plan to keep your donors informed. Well, last night I was at the Boston Foundation, and one of the panelists said, I, I can't believe I haven't heard this before because it makes so much sense to me. And this person said, remember, you are one conversation away from making an impact. And just as Bethany said, you don't know who that conversation is going to be with. But you're one conversation away. Might be talking about the Red Sox, but the next day it might be a check in the mail for $35,000. You just don't know that. So keep those conversations up. Try in, in your, when you're looking at what you're going to try and accomplish next year in running your, your organization, it's not 
how many grants I'm going to write, how many foundations are going to give me money, how many government contracts I'm going to enter into. How can I expand my major down the base? Because I think that's going to diversify your revenue for club and make you a more healthy organization. Maybe I'll just ask you a follow-up question because I think it's so. And it is, it's not on your. It's not on your list because um, I think you've already answered the question. The other second question I have, but um, so in terms of engaging major donors, um, can you give some examples of how we can get our volunteers, our board members, to do that? Exactly, how do you make that first phone call? What do you do to engage? It, it gets back to what Bethany said, and th this is something. I've always maintained, and this is coming from both being the lawyer and being the fundraiser, is that you can have the world's greatest mission and have dedicated people. It doesn't work unless you have the money. It just doesn't work. You need money to work to do your work. And so, just as Bethany said, you need to create a culture of philanthropy about the organization. So what I used to say when I remember developing this program at Mass Audubon, now, we were an organization of close to 180 staff back in the 90s. From the president down to the volunteers, everybody is a fundraiser. Now, if you're a naturalist going on a program, you're sitting down, you're always, it's in the back of your mind that the potential of every single person you're taking on that bird watching tour is a potential donor. And so you're giving them that opportunity to help out. You're constantly trying to develop those relationships because you never know where they're going to come. Now, you're not going to give, you know, before we do this you know, bird watching tour, we're going to have a financial questionnaire. That's not going to happen. But you are going to, you might make note of the fact that they came in a brand new Mercedes Benz or something. Who knows what happens? Or they have, you know, they have the pairs of Swarovskis that are $900. They're little things that they like. But again, it might be some guy what comes up in a beetle up old four with an old pair of binoculars who the reason he's rich is he doesn't spend money on those things. <laughs> so again it's just it's developing this wide range of, of relationships it's developing that culture of that everyone's a potential donor and it, it comes from then your devotion to your mission shines through and then it becomes very apparent to people and so again i'm not saying your mission work is, is less important than the Two, the two of them go hand in hand in making a successful philanthropic program. Great, thank you, Bill. So we have time for a few more questions. So Sarah, um, I'm going to move to you and ask you, um, how do foundations make their fundraising decisions? It always seems a little bit of a black hole, and I'm wondering if you can give us any insight on how, how those decisions get made. Um, okay, let's see. Well, I was talking with a colleague recently and she had the line, well, once you know one foundation, you know one foundation. So I think, unfortunately, for better or for worse, there's a huge amount of variation in how foundations are structured. Some are all family on the board, which is the case for the Island Foundation. Others have external advisors or people that they brought on. Some rely a lot more on staff to do like a docket where they would um, staff kind of pre-summarize um, applications for the board members, whereas other boards and ours is, is like this, prefer to review the whole application themselves. So I guess um, you know, roughly it, it is the board member's decision whether to um, approve a proposal. And I think the how, you know, going back to what I said about the fit, I think it's really about how well it meets, what is the foundation's mission, or what are the areas that they feel like they want to try to affect. Um, and if hopefully up front, there have been those conversations where you can work with someone there to try to understand what are the parts of your work that intersect the most closely with the foundation's mission, and how is it that your work is kind of moving the whole field, or the whole goal, the whole mission forward. I think that's about the best you know you can do to be in the best possible position. Again, like I said, I don't, I really don't think very often that is the case. That unless unless a foundation has a very specific on the website, you send the full proposal, and they have kind of a review process that clearly invites a bunch of unsolicited proposals and takes them through a process. I don't really think that there's something magical about the writing or what the perfect proposal that would change it. It really is about the fit. For what they want to get done. 
hope that is yeah. probably not totally satisfying. No, I think it's I important said. to know that foundations are kind of like people, right? <laughs> you gotta get to know them um, where possible. I think there are foundations that are national that it becomes clearly what you can read on their website and look between the lines. Um, so one more question. We have well, three minutes to, to answer it. Bethany, I was hoping you might be able to provide us with any um, local examples of work you have done to help small nonprofits meet their fundraising goal. Um, I think there are a lot of similarities, and we do work with organizations that are as tiny as no budget and startup, and as large as over 100 million in annual operating revenue, everything in between. We have seen every organization be unique, and we have seen trends that help them to either succeed or fail. But I would say that for the smaller nonprofit, um, and to find local, for me local is sort of greater Boston area, is local, um, it is almost always starting with a dysfunctional board, a board not understanding its role. That's almost an ongoing theme in every situation. And a frustrated executive or volunteer who's taken on the responsibility to be the chief administrator of the organization and not knowing why it doesn't work. So I think it very much goes back to putting um, the proper, helping the board to understand its role and then everything falls from there. We talked, and, and Bill and I both have said the same thing about the, um, the role of, sorry, Bob, the role of um, a culture of philanthropy in an organization and how important that is. Another quick story. Um, in the early 1960s, when John Kennedy was president, and you remember the space race to get a man on the moon, well, there's a, a story that travels around often in fundraising circles um, when we talk about building a culture of philanthropy. The reporter went into the NASA building and saw a gentleman who was wearing a shirt that might give you the impression that he was uh, in the maintenance department for the building. And the reporter went over and said to him, sir, can you tell me what you do? And his answer was the same as almost everyone's that this reporter encountered. He said, my job is to help get a man on the moon. The point of that is, whatever your role is, you are all rowing in the same direction with the same goal to advance the mission of your organization. And part of building that philanthropic culture is to get everyone to realize whether you have a board seat, whether you're a volunteer that staffs an event, whether you're a staff person, you all have the same job, which is to advance the mission of your organization. And to also incorporate a an attitude of gratitude for whatever role someone plays. You can't thank someone enough for what they do. And when it becomes done over and over again, it's natural and you don't have to remind people. Because if you think about, as I said before, there are enough causes. There are nearly 40,000 nonprofits in Massachusetts alone. There are enough causes that if somebody wanted to make a difference, they could do it in a million different ways, right? So they've for some reason chosen your cause and they've helped you to move a little bit further. And it should be natural to want to say thank you over again in many ways, whether it's people who have benefited from your organization, things that happen as a result of your organization. You want to make sure that it happens. It happens often by those who've benefited and by those who are in leadership roles in your organization. It's just critically important. And when it's done enough, it becomes second. Terrific. Well, this ends the sort of question and answer period from the moderator to the panelists, and we have 10 minutes to take any questions from the audience. Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. So we have five minutes to. My watch is different. Okay. You right there, Edie. I know you are, so. <laughs> Please. Actually, oh, I don't have a question. I just want to add something to um, Sarah mentioned the foundation directory. Many local libraries will have it because they can afford it. But for those of you who don't know, the Center for Nonprofit Management and Stonehill College will find foundations for you. If you call them and just, I believe the woman's name is, uh, first name is Sarah, I don't remember the last name, but she has interns working for her and she will gladly help put together a list of 
foundations and possible grant opportunities for you. Again, it's the Center for Nonprofit Management at Stonehill. All right. I hope that's great. I, I didn't know that, Edie, and Edie's on my board. So look, we just <laughs> found something that I didn't know about her that she could do to help with our organization. Can I just quickly yes. mention one thing? That's a great resource that I did not know about. I had found, I had um, reminded myself that Associated Grant Makers in Boston also will do that, and they have a whole library. You do have to go there, but they have staff that will help you, and they have on, I think it's May 6th, a class called Introduction to Foundation Research or Grants Research, so a lot of good resources on that site as well. That's terrific, and I think the important part about that is, is that there's somebody else who can do the research because the problem isn't maybe that we don't know that there are resources, it's that we don't have the capacity sometimes to get out there and do it. So is there any other questions from the audience for any of our panelists? Paul? Yeah, uh, Paul do, do we need to uh, yeah. do this? Thank you. Leah's going to take care of it. My name's Paul Lowenstein. I used to be a salesman a long time ago. And I one of the big concepts in sales is called the close, you know? You build up your arguments, you persuade, and you talk. But in the end, you have to ask me for the sale. I just wonder if any of you could give any tips about uh, closing with, uh, you know, fundraising and getting a big donation. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, again, it is having that right moment. And I think that unless you are in a capital campaign, it's really your annual gift where you're just trying to sustain the giving is a different close than on the annual campaign. Um, I'm involved in a situation now in the shelter in Cambridge. There's a bit of, of crisis management because the money has to come in by May 31st. And so the close there over the next six weeks is, is going to be, we need the money now. So you, you, your relationship, we're not going to have the time to build the relationship as much as we would like, but we have the, be the benefit of using a crisis situation to, in order to make that close. So you know, it's going to be not so many words. You know, I don't know you very well, but if I don't get this money, the project doesn't get done. And that that's those circumstances. So it, it depends on the circumstance. Um, very much when you look at a major uh, capital campaign, it's what's called the silent phase, where you're getting to know your donors. Um, the general public is unaware of really in that silent phase, you're focusing on those 300 people that are going to give you that $50 million. And so you have a little bit of time to develop, to tour them around the state, show them all your good work, find out what their interest is. Because unlike the, the sales, and I have not been a salesperson, but unlike the sales, I'm trying to get them to buy a particular object. I have the benefit of, of a wide variety of interests in a capital campaign. It might be land acquisition, it might be a specific, specific uh, education program um, of the organization. So I have the time to sort of develop where that interest is. Because again, it's been my experience that the best and biggest gift gets developed by the donor, not by us. Um, really, it, it, the good fundraiser is flexible. It's allowing it to grow to that point where eventually you have to make the ask. Now, you do have to make the ask. And yes. that, that, is, that is a problem for a lot of people. Uh, they just, you know, let's, they, they, I've been in countless meetings where, you know, development committee, you know, many meetings where, okay, they're a fundraising board, but they want to strategize the hell out of the problem. They just want to, let's think of this and let's think of that. And eventually, you got to ask. And as I said before, I have gotten a lot more no's than yeses in my career. But the yeses are very satisfactory, and I think the good ones are because we've developed a relationship. I'll just add something to that. I think fundraising is very much akin to sales. I think the best salespeople are those who have a solution to somebody's problem. And so when they're able to show them that they have a solution to their problem, they're much more likely to get the sale. Um, when you're asking someone for money for a nonprofit, you're asking them to make an investment in helping you to advance your mission. And I would agree with everything that was just said by Bill, but I would also add this. <clears throat> a slow yes is always better than a quick no. So feeling your way through, do you believe as you're getting closer to when you might make an ask that somebody has connected with you? 
that they're on board with your organization's mission, you're on board with understanding what their needs are, and maybe just a simple question, you know, I see you're excited about this, is it something you think you might support? And lean into that. Or this was wonderful, I'm sensing, and you told me you needed to get back in a few minutes. Could we set another time? I'd love to share a little bit more about what you mentioned was an interest. So, unless it's a crisis, I'm about the slow yes is better than the quick no. <laughs> thank you so much. So, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists. So, we'll give a 15 minute break, but there's an opportunity for you to come up and meet with and talk to these folks individually. If you have a question and answer that you'd like to, but we would ask that you be back in your seats minutes before the next session, which starts promptly uh, at 9.45. So a few minutes before, so we're not talking about it. Thank you.